honestly my guilty pleasure <laughs> I hate to say that but um this is don't call me daddy it's uh it's actually I don't know how to describe it it's like there's really not much story to it it's just I mean it's cute it's about this man that falls in love with another man and they have a child together or they adopt a child but it's a cute story it says in um i'm sorry if i can't pronounce these names right but when ryuji is left to raise his son shuji as a single father his best friend haino Hano steps up to help him. At first, their unconventional family life is happy, but as Hano's true feelings for Ryu grow more and more difficult to ignore, the pressure of staying closeted eventually becomes too much to bear. When Shuji starts getting teased at school for having two dads, Hano's fear seems to come true. He chooses to leave rather than risk messing up Ruji's and Shuji's life. Years later, when he comes home to care for his aging father and ends up seeing Ruji again, Hanu realizes it's time to face his own past and his future. It's just a cute, cute little story. Literally, um, this is kind of embarrassing, but, um, the little description or the label at the top here is manga boys love. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a little weird, but I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed at all. So, um, Shari... I apologize. Shari Lapina. Um, I adore this author, and I really, really, really love this book. Um, my favorite genre, um, in books is psychological thrillers. I love them. I find them really interesting. Let me get some water here. So, Anne and Marco Conti seem to have it all. A loving relationship, a wonderful home, and their beautiful baby Cora. But one night when they are at a dinner party next door, a terrible crime is committed. Suspicion immediately falls on the parents, but the truth is much more complicated. Excuse me. Sorry. What follows is the nerve-wracking unraveling of a family. Detective Rashbach knows that the panic couple is hiding something inside the curtained house. Anne and Marco both soon discover that the other is keeping secrets. Secrets they ke they've kept for years. The shocking truth will leave you breathless. And again, I really enjoyed this book. Definitely recommend that. Um, suicide notes? I have mixed feelings about this. I just feel like some of the parts were really irrelevant. Um, um, the writing seemed really juvenile, just, you know, like it wasn't meant for me, um, I don't know, here we go. Fifteen-year-old Jeff wakes up on New Year's Day and finds himself in the hospital. Make that the psychiatric ward. <laughs> I'm messing up so much today. Clearly, there's been a huge mistake. Aside from the bandages on his wrist, there's no reason why Jeff should be here. He's perfectly fine. He doesn't need to spend an hour every day talking to a therapist or acting out skits about feelings with the other teens on the ward. But a funny thing happens as Jeff's 45-day sentence tracks on. He realizes he's not as different from his fellow patients as, he, as he'd first thought. Compelling, witty, and refreshingly real, Suicide Notes is a darkly comic novel that explains excuse me, examines that fuzzy line between normal and the rest of us. And like I said, I have mixed feelings about this. Also, I forgot to get, to get a little more. 
forgot to give a trigger warning about this book. I apologize. Um, do not read this book if you're easily triggered by, um, you know, self-harm issues and, uh, you know, just, I don't need to explain it, just things like that. But, yeah, mixed feelings, mixed feelings. So, um, this is kind of juvenile literature, too. Um, it, it was okay, like, it wasn't great, it wasn't horrible. Um, it's about this girl who wants to get an abortion. I don't know, it's just, like I said, it's not that great. <laughs> okay, so. 17-year-old Veronica Clark never thought that she'd find herself holding a piece of plastic with two solid pink lines. How her boyfriend managed to get her pregnant is a mystery, but with a promising college-bound future now disappearing, Veron Veronica must consider decisions she never imagined she'd have to make an abortion. There's just one catch. The closest place to legally get one is 900 miles away in New Mexico. Desperate, she turns to Bailey Butler, a legendary misfit at Jefferson High and Veronica's ex-best friend. The plan is straightforward. A 14-hour drive to the clinic and back. What could go wrong? Not much, apart from crazed ex-boyfriends, kind-hearted trucks, truck stop strippers, ferret napping, aliens, and a broken friendship that can't be outrun. Soon, Veronica must risk everything to repair the hurt she's caused and discovers that the road to adulthood isn't easy, but it's better with a friend by your side. <laughs> So, like I said, this was like juvenile literature. It wasn't wasn't great, in my opinion. It is a beautiful story about friendship, though. I'll say that. Okay, so next we have The Giver. This was actually um, really cool to read. I never thought about reading it. Um, my fiancé, he said that he was required required to read it in school so i was like and he liked it and he doesn't really read a whole lot so i was like well if he says it's good then maybe i should try it out and i did and i really liked it um it's kind of hard to explain it's like a they have their own community all right here we go life in the community where jonas lives is idyllic designated birth mothers produce new children who are assigned to appropriate family units, one male, one female to each. Citizens are assigned their partners and their jobs. No one thinks to ask questions, everyone obeys. The community is a precisely choreographed world without conflict, inequality, divorce, unemployment, justice, or choice. Everyone is the same, except Jonas. At the ceremony of 12, the community's 12-year-olds eagerly accept their predetermined life assignments. But Jonas is chosen for something special. He begins instruction in his life's work with a mysterious old man known only as the giver. Gradually, Jonas learns that power lies in feelings. But when his own power is put to test, when he must try to save someone he loves, he may not be ready. Is it too soon or too late? So, I, I really did enjoy this one. It's really cool. some more water. 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 What are those? <laughs> oh. My bad. I'm a little awkward, I'm sorry. Okay, so I actually have two of these books. I have these are really cute. I love these. Um these are the manga style books. Super cute. I love it. A man and his cat very simple, very straightforward, um, almost exactly what you expect it to be, but, like, I don't regret reading it, I thought it was really cute, so that one, that one, what is wrong with my grammar today, oh my god, a kitten languishes in a pet shop, unwanted and unloved, even as his price drops with each passing day, no one spares him a glance, unless it's to call him names, having practically given up on life, the kitty himself is most shocked of all when an older gentleman comes into the store and wants to take him home. 
Will the man and the cat find what they're looking for in each other? And then this is the sequel. And there's more, um, but I have not been able to find them, so. I think his name is Fukumaru. Probably not saying that right, but it's okay. Now that Fukumaru and Mr. Kanda have found each other, every new day brings with it a series of surprises and delights. As the pair navigate their new life together, time, which had frozen for Mr. Kanda, following a personal tragedy, gradually begins to move again. Next we've got, um, I'm thinking of ending things. This was, um, my mother and I, we watched the movie together and didn't really understand, didn't know what to think of it. Um, and I don't really, I enjoyed reading this book. It's kind of like a psych thriller, like I like, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm still not very sure about it. There's a lot of theories. Okay. It says, you will be scared, but you don't know why. Yeah, there's just a lot of praise in this book, not really a description. That's fine. It's about a girl with mental illness. It was really cool to read, though, and learn about. Okay, so one of my favorites. Solutions and other problems. This is a hardcover. It is extremely freaking heavy. Um, the funniest shit I've ever read. Ever. It was so funny. So, it's like huge, as you can see. It's like a graphic novel. I'm gonna try to show it to you without dropping it. Let's see here are some of the pages. Like, this shit is so hilarious. I love it. Let's see if I can... Oh, I didn't even read the description. Oh, it's just, it's like question and answers from the, uh, from the author. Ah, here we go. Alright, so Ali Brosh, who is the author, lives as a recluse in her bedroom in Bend, Oregon. In recent years, she has become almost entirely nocturnal. Her hobbies include baseless speculation, spying, no stakes, gambling games that she makes up to pacify herself, actual games like magic, the gathering in Hearthstone. Learning about math and physics helps make the speculation less baseless and also occasionally walking around and looking at things from a safe distance. She is friendly, but spooks easy. Brash is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller and Goodreads Choice, Choice Awards winner, Hyperbole and a Half, which was named one of the best books of the year by NPR, The Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Library Journal, Salon, and AV Club. Brash has also given herself many prestigious awards, including Fanciest Horse Drop, drawing and most likely to succeed so totally recommend that one it's super funny super so these two books which are the last ones are by the same author i love alex um i have this is this came out like during the summer i have not read it yet um yeah so um like i said i love psychological thrillers and this was one that everyone was just raving and raving about. I'm in this Facebook group, like, it's like a book club. Ow, oh, just hit my toe. Uh, I'm good. Yeah, so this was, this is honestly one of my favorite books. I loved it. It was, it also about mental illness. I do read a lot about mental illness. Alright, I'm only gonna leave. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm only going to read a few paragraphs of this because this is actually a very, very long, um, very long description. 
Alicia had known since life was seemingly perfect, a famous painter married to an in-demand fashion photographer. She lives in a grand house overlooking a park in one of London's most desirable areas. One evening, her husband Gabriel returns home late from work and Alicia shoots him five times in the face and then never speaks another word. I forgot about that. Trigger warning. Alicia's refusal to talk or give any kind of explanation turns a domestic tragedy into something far grander. A mystery that captures the public imagination and, and casts Alicia into notoriety. The price of her art skyrockets, and she, the silent patient, is hidden away from the tabloids and spotlights at the Grove, a secure psychiatric unit in North London. Alright, and then we got the maidens. I'm so excited to read this. Like I said, I'm just, these descriptions are very, very long, so I'm just going to read a few paragraphs. Edward Fosca is a murderer. Of this, Mariana is certain, but Fosca is untouchable. A handsome and charismatic Greek tragedy professor, 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 just, just kill me now, please. Professor at Cambridge University. Fosca is adored by staff and students alike, particularly by the members of a secret society of female students known as the Maidens. Mariana Andros is a brilliant but troubled group therapist who becomes fixated on the Maidens when one member, a friend of Mariana's niece Zoe, is found murdered in Cambridge. And so this is my last book, or the last book that I'll be showing. Um, this is the one that I'm currently reading. Um, the reason that I have this little tab here, I just keep it on the front of the book, because if I'm reading, and, like, I, I usually stop at chapters, but I didn't, uh, sometimes I don't, so I'll just put, like, a, a sticky tab, like, right underneath the words, so I, I know where to pick up at, so that's the reason this weird little tab is here, but you'll see my bookmark, um, my cat ate it, my cat literally eats everything, and I can see that my light is slowly dying, so. <laughs> oh shoot, I think I just broke it more. Oh no. It's fine, it's fine, it's alright. So this is like hilarious so far, I love it. Laura Cleary makes a living by sharing inappropriate comedy sketches with millions of strangers on the internet. She writes songs about her anatomy, talks trash about her one-eyed rescue pug, and sexually harasses her husband, Stephen. And it pays the bills. Now, in her first ever book, Laura recounts how she went from being a dangerously impulsive, broke, unemployable, suicidal, cocaine-addicted narcissist, crippled by fear and hopping from one toxic romance to the next. To a happy some, excuse me, to a happy more than not somewhat rational, meditating yoga with good credit, a great marriage, a fantastic career, and a beautiful son. Still, above all, she remains an amazingly talented, adorable, and vulnerable self-described idiot. With Laura's signature brand offbeat, no holds barred room, humor, idiot introduces you to a wildly original and undeniably relatable new voice. So, like I said, it, it's so funny, but I, I literally started school, like, last week, and I just haven't been able to read as much now because I'm so busy, but it's okay. Alright, well, that's all I have for today, but I hope that you guys are happy and safe and healthy. Finger flutters, finger flutters. Yeah, but it was great spending time with you today. Okay, bye-bye.